Hey, I want to start out with a question for you today. Is there a recipe um, that has been passed down in your family? Maybe it's a recipe that grandma always made for like the special occasions and you'd walk in on Christmas Day or on Thanksgiving and you would just smell it. Can anyone literally just like smell something? For me, it was scotch roots. Anyone else like the Scotch Roos, like the Rice Krispies on the bottom and then the chocolate layer on the top? Just, oh, my mouth is watering right now just even thinking about my grandma's Scotch Roos. You can, you can just taste it, really. Um, it's a recipe that has been passed down. Um, my mom now makes it all the time, and it's been passed down to the grandkids. So uh, our family makes it, and my sister's family makes it. Um, and uh, I just think it's so interesting looking at things that have been passed down and the importance of even recipes. Does anyone have a relative that like brought a recipe to their grave, though, where it's like, I am the only one who's going to make this, and I will bring it to the grave? I was looking online. I found here's a few pictures. There's some gravestones of they literally brought the recipe to their grave, right? It's, it's the cookies, it's the fudge. And I started thinking, it's like, the recipes are so easy to get like on Pinterest, but we should, if they brought a recipe to their grave, we should probably be looking to gravestones for recipes. I think they must, be, they must hold a lot of weight and a lot of value if they make it on headstone. Um, I went to an auction a few years ago, um, and I love going to farm auctions on the weekends. I, I thoroughly enjoy it. When they say one man's junk is another man's treasure, I buy one man's junk, and I get home, and my, my wife says, it's now your junk. Well done, right? But no, I, I love going to farm auctions, and there was a farm auction I was at, and uh, an item came up for bid, and it was a small wood box with a bunch of recipes. And that really doesn't have much value, right? Like you look at it, you can get all the recipes you want on Pinterest. You can search something online and pull it up instantly. You don't need to look through this recipe. There's just not a lot of value in something like that anymore. Um, but when that item got brought up for bid, it ended up selling for about $800, I believe. Um, and you may ask, why did that bring so much? Um, it was actually because there was family members there who wanted that. They found value in it um, because grandma's instructions were on those recipes. See, grandma had lived a full life for them, and on those recipes were instructions on how to make sure that you don't burn the brownies, or how to make sure that the brownies are set at the right temperature so that they don't get done, the outside doesn't get done too quickly and the inside isn't still like doughy or runny yet, right? They're instructions from somebody who has lived life before and who had made those mistakes but wrote clear instructions on, okay, th this is how to do it right. This is how to make sure the cake is as fluffy as it should be, um, all of a sudden, that little box of recipes from grandma is priceless for that family because it's advice and instruction from somebody who mattered. It was advice and instruction from someone who had lived a full life, who had made the mistakes and, and tried things out and figured out what worked best and lived a full life to the extent where it's like, this is, this is how it's done well. Um, in the same way today, we are going to look at really an icon, a, a big person in the Bible. We've looked over the last seven weeks at a man named David. Uh, we've spent time looking at the stories throughout David's whole life, from the stories um, of David being anointed to the story of David and Goliath and how he slayed that slayed how David ran from Saul and the story of David becoming king and then the story of David and Bathsheba, the stories of how David uh, sometimes failed at being a parent. Um, and even though David had many failures, he had many great things happen in his life, but even though he had many failures, we know David as being a man after God's own heart. But now, 
in this point of the story, we find David at the end of his life. And you could really say this is the end of an era. And he has final instructions. He has advice and instructions to a man named Solomon who's his son. And his son is going to soon take the kingship. And these instructions, this advice is coming in the same way that we look at grandma's recipes. Right? It's like this is, I've lived this. I've tried this out. How, how are we, thou shalt, how should we live from this point? So David is left with a few words, these final instructions to Solomon, Solomon and it comes out of 1 Kings chapter 2. I want to read these words for you here now. It said, when the time uh, drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon, his son. I am about to go the way of all the earth. And that's just kind of a nicer way to say I'm about to be six foot under, right? He said, so be strong. Act like a man. And I want a quick pause here a minute um, and touch on what David is saying when he's saying act like a man. Um, guys in the room, have you ever been told uh, guys don't cry? Right? Guys shouldn't cry. They should not show emotions. I think I was told that growing up, but primarily because I probably cried too much. It's probably good for me to be told by my dad, you should maybe not cry all the time. I have my mom's genes in that. Um, but uh, often I think our culture misrepresents what it means to act like a man. I think for years men have been told that men are emotionless and are, are just steady and they don't show emotion. They do not cry. They do not show weakness. Um, but that is not what David is saying in this. Um, David is saying, act like a man. There's actually another verse that Paul uses in the New Testament in Corinthians that says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like a man, be strong. And in both of these, they actually sound pretty similar. In both of these references, act like a man actually translates to one Greek um, kind of like saying or, or word that actually means act in in a courageous and virtuous manner. So what David is saying in this is he's not saying act uh, masculine. What he's saying is be courageous. Act in a virtuous manner. Be these things. All right, so that's, that's what that is. So be strong, act courageous, and act virtuous. And observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and his commands, his laws and his regulations, as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you go, and that the Lord may keep his promise to you. If your descendants watch how they live, and if they walk faithfully before me and with all their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel." Now, you yourself know what Joab, son of Zero, oh dear, I'm going to be honest with you. I have a very Dutch tongue, so anything like above pepper is too spicy, and anything with an I and an H in it in a name is going to be too hard for me. So there's a lot of this, so just bear with me in this. Joab, son of Zero, whole, uh, did to me what he did to the two commanders of the armies, the Israel's armies, Abner, son of Ner, and Amasa, son of Je Jather, he killed them, shedding their blood in peacetime as if it was in battle. And with that blood, he stained the belt above, around his waist and the sandals on his feet. Deal with him according to your wisdom and do not let his gray head go down to the grave in peace. We'll talk about all that in a minute yet. But show kindness to the sons of Barzillia the, of Gilead and let them be among those who eat at your table. They stood by me when I fled from your brother Absalom. And remember, you have with you uh, Shema, 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 son of Jerah, the Benjamite from Bahurim, who called down bitter curses on me the day I went to Mahaniam. Okay, we all with me yet? When he came down to meet me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, I will not put you to death by the sword. So what we see here is David promised this man, I will not put you to death. Me personally, I will not put you to death by the sword. But he says to Solomon, but now do not consider him innocent. You are a man of wisdom and you will know what to do to him. Bring his, head, bring his gray head down to the grave in blood. Then David rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. 
Um, I want to quickly be transparent in this because as I was spending time studying this, I, I first read through the first part and thought, oh, this is, this is super good. This is, this is great. We can talk about the end of David's life and the really nice advice and instruction he has about spending more time with God, being obedient and being strong, acting like a man, and it'll be a nice, quick, easy message and we can send people out. But then you get to the end of it and it's like, we're, what, what are we doing? We're bringing his head to a grave. Like, what? There's some things that we need to deal with in this. So if you're reading through the marathon edition, the marathon part of the Bible where you're reading through it with us, um, we, there's things in the Bible that come up where you're like, what is this? But we believe here at the Foundry that that scripture, that the Bible is God-breathed and all of it matters, and there's life that can be spoken into all of it. So we'll, we'll get into all of that as we go, but what, what I want to quick make, make a notice of, the advice that David gives, the advice that David gives to Solomon. I want to first note the advice that he doesn't give, right? David is saying his last words. He's on his deathbed. What we don't hear David saying is make sure uh, you spend a lot of time in retirement. Maybe retire early from the kingdom. Uh, make, sure you, make sure you put your feet up on the beach for a few years. Yeah, work hard for a bit, but then, then make sure you relax, right? He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, buy that chariot that you've been window shopping, right? You've been looking at that chariot. Why don't you just go buy it? Just make sure you have the pleasures of this world. Or look at, look at all the Aryan nations and eat the best fruit. Make sure you spend lots of money on the best stuff from around the world. No, that's, that's not what David says. So what advice then does David give on his deathbed? He gives us five things. He says, be strong, act like a man, right? That's that act uh, with courageousness, act with that uh, vir- good, the good virtues. Two is observe what God requires. So it's the walking in obedience and keeping his commands. Number three says, do not let Joab's gray head descend to Shiloh in peace. Now remember, if you've been reading through with us in devotions and through the marathon edition, what this is speaking about is Joab really tricked um, these these other commanders in a time of peace. Um, so this is this was not a fair way to kill somebody. He killed Abner and Amasa. And what David is saying is in this is do not let that go unpunished. Right? Do not let that go unpunished. Number four. He says, show kindness to the sons of Barzillia, um, which is out of 1 Kings 2 verse 7. Uh, those Sons of Barcilia, that was, that was a man uh, who, uh, when David was fleeing from Saul, uh, that man showed him comfort, and he showed him a place that he could stay and rest, it, rest his head. And what David is saying is, show kindness to him. Show kindness to his family, because he has shown kindness to me. Number five, it says, keep an eye on Shemai. Am I saying that right, Shemai? Shimei, that's a better way to say it, uh, son of Jared, don't let him go unpunished. This is the man, um, it, this was uh, a while ago in the readings where when David was going around with his army, there was a man you might remember who started just like throwing rocks at David's army and the army of God and throwing curses at these men and would just follow, the, follow them doing these things. And David says, do not let that go unpunished. What we actually find later in the story is this guy comes to David with, I think it was an army of a thousand people, a thousand men, and he comes to apologize and David says, okay, fine, I, I won't kill you, but you just have to stay in this area. I, I kind of need to keep an eye on you because you've been trouble in the past. And he kind of, he doesn't listen to David and he flees for a while. So what David is saying in this is watch out for that guy. Do not, do not let that go unpunished because he is someone you need to watch out for. He, he can be deceitful. He can, he may continue to throw threats at you. So we've got these five things, but what David says in this to end it, he actually gives a promise coming out of these five things. If you do these five things well, what David says is that you may prosper wherever you go, right? David says, God will bring uh, prosperity to you. And he also says this, um, 
this concept that there will always be a successor from our family line that will be on the throne. God will bless you in this way if you keep to these five different things. So when we look at the last words of people, often there is clarity that comes. Often when uh, people have lived a full life and have experienced things, there is a fog that is lifted at the end. Because I would argue that this world throws a fog on us. And there's clarity that we can't see sometimes until the end where it's like, oh, this, this is what truly matters in life. This is what we should be spending time on. So I think this instruction, this advice is so helpful. Um, but as one of the pastors here at the Foundry, um, I've had the opportunity of spending time with people who um, are close to being with their Heavenly Father. Um, I've gotten the chance to uh, just sit with family members who have watched loved ones pass away. And there is so often clarity in that of what is important in life and what matters in life. Often, it's a few things. It's um, their walk with God matters. In the end, uh, their families care about that and those people, their walk with God matters. Um, also, we see that their family matters, that people matter. The way that they've treated people and the way um, that they interact with people, that all of a sudden matters. If you've seen or uh, just had interactions with somebody who may be close to seeing their heavenly father, um, their posture is often different, right? Like the way they even speak to people is often so much kinder, right? They have just a different posture about life because I would argue that there is a clarity that comes when that fog is lifted, when it says, no, this is, this is how we are to treat people. And I think that comes through in David's words. But we right now have a blessing, because if you're watching this, um, wherever you are, maybe it's at See You Monday or if it's online, wherever you're watching this, um, there we have a blessing right now. We are actively living and breathing if you're watching this. Right? We don't know for how long or when God may call us home. But what we do know is that we have an opportunity right now to take the advice from David. Because we can put ourselves in the position of Solomon and say, okay, how are we supposed to live um, knowing that we, had, had, that we have advice and instruction from somebody who has lived such a full life, the man after God's own heart? So when we look to sum up these, these, piece of, these pieces of advice and instruction from King David, there's actually another verse that comes to mind. Um, it's actually out of Micah, which is a few um, books later in the Old Testament from the prophet Micah. Uh, six verses eight, I want to read this a minute, and I think uh, this will ring true to a lot of the things we just heard. He has shown you, O mortal, or O people, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? This really speaks to like what David is saying. This, this is how you shall live. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. See, doesn't that really just speak to what David's final instructions were, his final advice to Solomon? First thing, I want to break it apart, and we'll kind of, we'll kind of piece these things together here. Because the first one is act justly. When we look at David's final instructions, there's two of these piece of, pieces of advice or instructions that fit in with this act justly, that you look at these things and you're like, oh yeah, David wants us to be just in this. He says, do not let Joab's gray head descend um, in peace and keep an eye on the son of Gera. Don't let him go unpunished. What we find in this is David is saying, justice matters. And we want justice to matter too, right? I think in this world and in this culture, it has taken the word justice and made its own name for it. But I want us to understand today that God, uh, God has a different view on justice and justice matters to God. And David shows this clearly in this with two of his points speaking to justice. Uh, we, we all want justice to matter. Right? And it matters in our homes, it matters in our workplaces, and here's the truth in it. If we don't have justice, if we don't allow justice to be a part of our lives, 
then nothing really matters, right? Then the mercy piece doesn't even fit into this anymore. If we don't allow justice to be a part of our lives, what matters? See, when we look at our kids, like, I'm, I have McKenna, who is, um, we're getting close to, she'll be sub- two in September. So she's just starting to, like, like just push the lines a little bit to see once, see once what she can get away with. Like, if she's running away from us, we'll say, McKenna, stop. And she'll turn and look around and then, like, smile and run. And you're like, oh, girl, like, <laughs> but here's the deal. If I, as a father... Don't um, punish that in some way. And I'm trying to, like, how do you punish a year and a half year old? You're like, sit down. And like, ah! Right? But it's like, if, if I don't, as she continues to grow up, um, make sure that justice is served at an appropriate level for her, um, she will grow into just a menace of society. Right? Like, if I don't bring about justice in her life and justice in our family's life, I don't know what she'll turn into because she doesn't, she doesn't get what parameters are and she doesn't understand what good is and what what being kind is justice matters in our world and justice matters in our workplace and I think what we need to see clearly in what David is saying in this is that he's saying don't let things go unpunished don't just lay down on the ground and let things happen I think like we we talked a few weeks ago when uh when David's, one of David's daughters, Tamar, uh, was, was sexually abused, right? He let that go unpunished. And all of the things that cascaded from not, not handling that issue, I think David is speaking to this here. Do not let things go unpunished. Be just. Make sure justice happens. Now, I want to continue in this. Um, the next one in this is love mercy. So from uh, Micah it says, uh, "Be or from Micah it says uh, to act justly and to love mercy." What we see in the story of David when he's talking about loving mercy, uh, there's actually what he says is, "Show kindness to the sons of Gilead and let them be among those who eat at your table." See when David says, "Let them eat at your table," it's not just uh, just an invitation. This is the king's table. Table. Solomon is going to be the king. So this invitation to eat at the king's table is kind of a big deal in this. And I honestly think um, there is no better way to show kindness than in this way, the table. We actually have here at the Foundry, one of our values is the table. Um, and I, I love this about the Foundry is that Gathering around food, um, I think, matters in an immense way. Showing kindness around food, I think, is so, so good. Because you can show kindness to someone, right? You can open the door um, as someone's walking into Meyer. Well, I guess not. They're all automatic. So you can step on it for them, right? And be like, here you go, right? You can show kindness by opening a door. You can show kindness by smiling to someone as you're walking past them in the sidewalk. I I think those things are great. But I think showing kindness in what David is saying and when he says like the, the loving mercy piece, eat at your table. It's almost taking it to the next level. Maybe you have a coworker that you work with and you think, man, I I, I want to show them Jesus, but I don't know how to have a conversation about faith with them. Maybe inviting them to your home, inviting them to have dinner with your family. Um, I don't think that ever happens, right? I don't think that's something that happens a lot. Um, and I think what would be so beautiful out of that is just not having an agenda, inviting them into your home and sharing a meal with them and having your family there and inviting their family in and showing them what mercy and kindness look like. And I'm going to be honest with you. I think this is so foreign in our culture that they're going to be like, why? Why did you do that? Like, you didn't, you weren't trying to sell me anything. Like, why did you, why did you do this? And that right there is our door. That's our window to speak truth and to love and to show the mercy of God come out in the simple ways we treat and act people. And I love that David is so intentional where it's like, not just show kindness to these guys who have showed me kindness. Let them eat at our table. Let's bring them in and show them what 
what, the, what mercy looks like and what God's mercy looks like simply by the way that we're acting. Um, I also love in this that in uh, Micah, it says to love mercy. Uh, I think there's a big difference of just like being merciful, like being kind and loving mercy. Now, loving means like it's, you're really actively seeking it out. Like you're not just being merciful. You're actively looking for ways to be merciful. So go out, go into the world, look look at the people around you, look for the relationships that you have, invite them in, right? Love them in a way that they don't expect it. Now, if you're running, you're going for a run, don't like chase someone down and be like, I'd like to invite you for dinner. (laughs) That's not what we're saying here. Look at the people you have relationship with and think, you know, who may need this encouragement right now? Who may need to know the love and the mercy that God has Maybe there, there's, there's got to be someone who's popping in your head right now. Invite them to your table. Invite them to dinner with your family and allow your actions to speak the mercy of God. Okay, next one is this. Um, walk humbly with your God. We've got act justly, love mercy, and now walk humbly with your God. With David, um, he, he had a few, the, the piece of advice that he gave is be strong and obey the Lord's commands. Um, and if you're just joining with us, if you've just been with us for a few weeks now, um, the Lord's commands could be a very intimidating thing, right? It's like it, you read the Bible and you're like, there are commands everywhere. Now, it, from the beginning, we, we've been in a series and we were slowly going through the whole Bible where we looked at Genesis and God gave one command um, and the people broke it. And then in Exodus, we have God gave them the 10 commandments and the people broke that. And then in Leviticus, we have over 600 laws that are given because it's like God probably was saying, how clear can, can I make it? Then in the New Testament, I want to briefly, uh, briefly mention this. One of the religious leaders asked Jesus, Jesus Christ, the son of God, What is the greatest commandment, right? It's like there are so many. He's trying to trap Jesus. But what is the greatest commandment? How how are we supposed to live? And Jesus replies to him, love God and love others. When we look at what it means to be strong and obey the Lord's commands, it's those two things. Love God and love your neighbor. Walking humbly with your God is these very things. I think when we walking humbly with God really, really provides motivation and uh, the, the passion to do all of these other things. I think this is why it's even said last, where it's like act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. When we walk humbly with, with God, when we're doing this intentionally, these other things we get super passionate about, right? When we see, when we read God's word and we see what God is excited about and what he is passionate about, we take that on and we show his mercy to the world around us in the same way. Um, I was reading in a devotional a few months ago that uh, Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes in Life Together, it says this, I think it's worded so, so well. Whoever cannot be alone should be aware of community. And this speaks to me because I'm like, I only want to have community and I never want to be alone. So this spoke to me really clearly. Uh, Whoever cannot be alone should be aware of community. Such people will only do harm to themselves and to the community. Alone you stood before God when God called you. Alone you had to obey God's voice. Alone you had to take up your cross, struggle and pray. And alone you will die and give an account to God. I think that's so powerful there. You cannot avoid yourself. For it is precisely God who has called you out. And if you do not want to be alone, you are rejecting Christ's call to you. And you can have no part in the community of those you are called See, and I think this echoes this Isaiah passage where it says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. When we talk about walking humbly with your God, this is what it means. 
It means maybe taking a step back out of community so that you can spend alone time with God. Spending time humbly with God and looking at his word and allowing it to breathe life into you. We can do the other things so much better. We can be just and we can be merciful only if we know how God views mercy and how God views justice. In those ways, be humble in your walk with God. Allow him to speak through you in everything we do. I would argue that if we're missing this piece, and, and I'm conv- I've been convicted of this over the last few months too, if we're missing this piece, David says to walk in obedience with God. Micah says to walk humbly with God. If we're missing this, we're missing everything. See, as we wrap up today, put yourself in the seat of Solomon. And I, I, I don't know what, what, it, what the scene looked like as David was telling this advice and instruction to Solomon, but I can just picture David starting to get weak, right? And I can just picture Solomon grabbing David's hand and David saying these words to him, right? These final instructions of how to live life that echo Micah, right? As, as a dad, these were his final words to him. These words of instruction and wisdom I'm sure, echoed in Solomon's mind as he continued to live life, as those very words should echo in ours. I want to read Micah one more time for us. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for your word And we thank you for the life that David lived, um, understanding that there were mistakes made, but there was so much experience and knowledge and wisdom that he continued to turn to you. Uh, We know him as a man after your own heart. And God, I ask that as we uh, take his words on his deathbed and the clarity that he was given in those final moments, that we take those things and put it into our own lives. God, I ask that we even look at Micah and the words of acting justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly with you. I ask that we put that into our lives. But God, we realize that we need to spend time with you in order for all those things to happen well. God, I ask that we take a step back and we we start our day with you and we end our day with you. And you convict us of things in our lives that may need to be fixed. But I also ask that you give us mercy and you give us knowledge, and you allow us to see how justice may need to fit into our lives. God, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the way you speak to us. In your name we pray. Amen.